Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Not every destination is clear. And not every journey is easy. Sure, some are relatively straightforward. We just follow the GPS or get on the plane or walk down the street and voila, we're there. But as we know, that's not always the case. After all, not every destination is physical. And as we traverse the streets of life, we all know that sometimes we, even the best of us, get a little lost. Maybe some of us are there today. Maybe most of us. It's not really the place we long to be. All things being equal, we much prefer a map to a general direction, safety to insecurity, certainty to ambiguity. But if we had all of those things, friends, we wouldn't need faith. The irony, of course, is that when we're experiencing those things, faith is often hardest. When everything's going well, we think, oh, yes, it's easy to believe in a gracious and loving God. No, it's when things start to go astray, when we find ourselves lost, that faith becomes hard. We've experienced that this week, haven't we? It's hard to hold on to faith as we keep in our prayers that family of Trayvon row. When everything's going well, it's easy to hold on to faith. When someone is lost, when we are lost, it's hard to grasp on, to find that thing which is tangible and hang on to it. And let's face it, friends, there have been too many times recently when that proverbial bomb has gone off in our life. It's in those moments after when we are trying to pick up the pieces, when we're trying to make sense of what this new world looks like, that we find ourselves lost. We've felt it, haven't we? As the ever-present reality of gun violence has made its way into the public consciousness, we have felt a little lost. As the racism which we once thought was an outlier has found its way towards the center has come to be, we have felt ourselves a little lost. As year by year that gap between those who have and those who have not has widened, as phone by phone we have relegated the sex education of our children to pornography, as tweet by tweet we have survived a reign of rhetorical terror, we have felt ourselves a little lost. Is it any wonder that we, as a people of faith, don't always know where to turn? Given everything that's going on in our world, given everything that's going on in our own lives, is it any wonder that we don't know which direction to face? We know that thoughts and prayers are helpful, but aren't always enough. We don't always know which direction to face. But make no mistake, friends, we, as a people of faith, have a final destination. We know where we want to go, not after death, but right now. We know where we want this life to take us. It's what Jesus called the kingdom of God, that promised land in which we all finally and fully live as Christ commanded. And if we're ever going to get there, friends then we as a people of faith owe it to this world to find our way again. And so today, as we tick past the halfway points in Lent, as we lose an hour but gain a little more light, we pause together in this broken world that we might learn from the mistakes of those who have come before and trust that grace will be our guide. We have two scripture lessons today. 
One from the Old Testament, one from the New, one a story and one a promise, one obscure and one famous, one we never quote and one we often misquote. We will look at both, though one story will dominate. Now, most of us know the beginning of the story of the Exodus, either from reading our Bibles or that Charlton Heston movie. We know it's the story of the Israelite people being delivered from slavery in Egypt. We might remember Moses standing up to Pharaoh, let my people go. There's some plagues, there's that harrowing journey through the Red Sea, the reception of some law and rolling of the credits. Only the story doesn't end there. You see, the Hebrew people, the Israelite people, didn't just leave slavery in Egypt and then, boom, automatically find themselves in the promised land. No, that would be too easy. No, as it turns out, they had to do some wandering. They left slavery in Egypt and found themselves lost. Maybe we know the feeling. They knew where they wanted to go. It was the promised land, that land of milk and honey, that promised place, their ancestral home. They knew where they wanted to end up, but the journey itself was difficult. Not all destinations are clear and not all journeys are easy. Sometimes in life we know where we want to end up. We know where we are supposed to be, where we long to be, where we hope to be, that place which we can almost reach out and touch, but we can't always get there. We might think of that mom struggling with postpartum depression. We might think of that student who's struggling to get it all done. We might think of that executive who's in over their head. We might think of that couple longing for a child. Sometimes the destination is clear. The journey itself is hard. And the longer it takes, the longer we're on that path, the more impatient we become. We start to recognize all the other things that are not going right in our lives, and we begin to complain a little at first, and then it comes on a little bit more. We recognize it from the people Israel, right? It makes sense. They're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed when they leave slavery. They're excited about entering the promised land, and then they wander for 40 years years. Who among us wouldn't complain? Yes, it seems strange that a people of faith would complain every once in a while, but remember, it was a long time ago and we've come a long way. (laughs) And at least they know who to complain to. See, this is the last of the complaining narratives in the Exodus story. And the first time, they direct it to God. See, before it was always just to Moses. Now it's to Moses and God. And they lift up that cry, that complaint, that fear, that anger which is in their heart. And they say to God, why have you brought us out of slavery in Egypt only to let us die in the wilderness? Why have you brought us out of slavery in Egypt only to let us die in the wilderness? We recognize this, don't we? If not in those words, we know what it's like to beat one thing and then been smacked by another. We know what it's like to find our way through one obstacle in our lives and then get a new diagnosis. We know what it's like to find our way through and then been smacked by that proverbial truck. We know what it's like. And in those moments... It sometimes helps to cry, and all things being equal, lifting up our prayers, our cries to God, is not such a bad place to turn. Why not lift up our prayers to God? Jesus himself, as we'll see in just a couple of weeks, cries out, Echoing that 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the longer we stay in that mode, the more negative things seem. 
And it's hard to even recognize the blessings in our lives. We start complaining about even the things that are there to help sustain us. We hear it in the Israelite people. The first part makes a total sense. We recognize the pain and the fear and the anger that comes in it. Why have you brought us out of slavery in Egypt only to let us die in the wilderness? But then they move to that next piece. There's no food and there's no water. Plus, we don't like the food. Do you hear? It's not always rational, but then we get to it. There's no food and we don't like the food. (laughs) And the challenge is that sometimes we get stuck in that mode of complaint and complaint and complaint that we forget to pay attention, that we get a little stuck. And when we get stuck on the travels through life, friends, there are other dangers that arise. For the Israelite people, it was snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? (laughs) We're told that poisonous snakes, that is, fiery snakes, came out and started to bite them so that many Israelites were bitten and many died. And then, let's just get this on the table, it does say in the scripture lesson that God sent the poisonous snakes. Yikes. <clears throat> Truth be told, we'd really like to get out our pen and just cross that part out to flip the page, move on to the next story, to ignore that part altogether. After all, that's not the God we believe in. Friends, we don't believe in a God that sends poisonous snakes when we complain. My inbox can attest to this. <laughs> we clearly don't believe that that's the case, and it makes sense. It's not the God we have come to understand, the God who is made known to us in the gospel. Remember that passage, for God so loved the world. Not some of us, not one of us, not a few of us, not those who look like us or smell like us or think like us or love like us, but all the world. It's hard to get bigger than the world. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son that whoever believes in him, that is, whoever takes his message to heart, will find Life. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In other words, we don't believe in that kind of God because it is opposite of grace. Friends, the promise of grace is that there's nothing we can do or say to lose the love of God. That's what makes it amazing. But with it comes freedom to live in this world. And that freedom means that sometimes bad things are going to happen, both to us and the people we love. Sometimes bad things are going to happen, but they are not sent by God as some cosmic punishment. That's not the way it works. No, the freedom we have to live in this world, which means, means that sometimes bad things are going to happen. There's no promise that as a people of faith, they won't. No, the promise is that we won't be alone when they happen. And we can face a lot if we know we don't have to face it alone. That's why we're here. That's what we just committed to in baptism. That's what it means to be a part of a church. We have people who will walk alongside us through the journey of life, and when we get off track, will point us in the direction of life. This strange little passage ends even stranger. You see, when the people are bitten by snakes, they complain even more, like you would do. And they cry out to Moses and to God, and God says to Moses, well, take a pole, put a poisonous snake on it, have the people stare at it, and they will live. And so he does. He takes a bronze snake, he puts it on a pole, and the people stare at it, and they live. It's why we still, to this day, have as the medical insignia a pole with snakes. And while there are lots of explanations, possible explanations for this, including just making sense later on as they were writing this passage of why there was a bronze snake in the temple, 
perhaps there is something in this that is worth paying attention to. To be clear, if you are bitten by a poisonous snake, don't just stare at it on a pole. Call 911. But recognize what else might be happening in this passage, friends. Maybe this story is about what we might do if we really want to overcome the serpents, those proverbial serpents which are obstacles to us on our journey through life. That is, what would it mean to actually pay attention to those things which are biting us in this world, to take them up, to stare them in the eye, to find out how to overcome them. Friends, if we want to solve the challenges of this world, we can't pretend like they're not there. As the gospel writer would later say, people loved the darkness rather than the light. We all sometimes would prefer to just not know, but we as a people of faith don't get that luxury. If we want to overcome the reality of gun violence, of racism, of sexual inequality, of anything else, any of the other ills in this world, those corporate sins, then we as a people of faith have to lift them up, to look them in the eye, and to find a way around them, to keep pointing each other in the direction of life. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must we lift up the Son of Man. That is, we are here to lift up the Christ-like life, which means confronting those injustices of this world. It means paying attention to them. And while it's easy for us to say the church should just stay out of those places, it's like the equivalent of shut up and dribble. We don't get that luxury. As a people of faith, we have something to say to the brokenness of this world. And we have the way to life through love. And if we don't share it, who will? If we want to find our way to the promised land, to that place in which we all finally and fully live as Christ commanded, then we owe it to ourselves to address the ills of this world in love. The good news is that we get to do it together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind, but now I see. Amen.